and now you are live and now let me share with you the screen and then we will begin okay okay in this chapter we're going to try to understand uh, the issue of deficits and debt in other words uh, what is the difference between a deficit and what's the difference between a, a national debt what is the origins you know why or how big is the national debt and then uh, what is the impact of deficits and a debt in a nation specifically economic activity and then who's actually the person that actually going to be carrying or they are presently carrying the burden of a national debt, which simply means who's actually going to pay for this. Okay, as we have been experiencing in the last, in the last couple of months, in the last couple of weeks, the United States government has been involved in the economy. You know, they have been following what we have learned yesterday, Keynesian economics, in which we say that if the economy is in a recession, what we need is government intervention through fiscal stimulus. Well, in the last couple of weeks, the United States government has been involved in trying to stimulate the economy out of a recession. And the way they have been doing it is by the creation of jobs, by the purchases of government purchases, you know, by the reduction in taxes, and also by the increase in transfer payments. So just in the last eight weeks, the United States government has spent about $3.1 trillion, $3.1 trillion that we did not have. Okay, uh, right before you left for the spring break, uh, the national debt was $21 trillion. Today, the national debt is $25 trillion. And we're going to discuss that. The reason is why is the debt going so, so large and what's going to be the result of this, right? So again, the government has been involved in the economy by reducing taxes, increasing government spending, a combination of both. And what we're trying to do is increase the economy to shift the aggregate demand. But by doing this, we have been borrowing money. So as a result of this, then we're now experiencing an increase in the national debt and an increase in the budget deficit. Now, let me tell you the difference between a budget deficit and a national debt. Okay. Uh, the government operates on a, what's called a, fisc a, a fiscal year. You know, the fiscal year of the government. Anybody knows when the government fiscal year begin? Anybody has an idea? Okay, the fiscal year begins on October 1st. It's October, November, and December. That's the first quarter of the year. Okay, so what we have is this. This is how the government begins to collect information. And again, I, I, this will not be a question on the exam. This is just for your knowledge so you understand how all this works. Okay, the government, two years before, two years before the beginning of the fiscal year, which begins on October 1st, so today we are in the fiscal year 2020, which actually begins October 1st. So it's, you know, it's October, November, December, that's quarter number one. And then we have quarter number two, which is January, February, and March. And we are now in quarter number three. So as you can see, you know, which is, uh, what is it? So this is December, this is October to December, then January to January, February, March. So this is April 1st to April, May, June. And then quarter number four is, you know, uh, July, August, and September. Okay, so this is in four quarters. So the government plans what they're going to be doing during this fiscal year. Again, they divide the year into quarters, quarter one, two, three, and four. Two years before, the Congress begin to discuss what are, we, what are we going to do, what are we going to buy, what are we going to give, blah, 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 blah. They send the information to all the government agencies. The government agencies send back the budget that they want, you know, how much money they want for this year. Uh, it passes to Congress, then it goes to Senate, and then it's ratified and it becomes effective on October 1st. Okay, again, they make plans based on what they foresee the economy is going to be. You know, in other words, they, 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 they forecast revenue, they forecast the level of unemployment, and based on that, they say, this is how much we're going to receive in revenue, and this is how much we want to spend. So they create a budget that looks something like this, and I'm just making up stories, okay? So for example, they say, you know, we're going to start about $180 billion, and then we're going to spend all the way to $1.3 trillion, and then the following quarter, we're going to reduce the expenditures and so on. So the green line represents the, the what's called the, the plan budget, what they plan they're going to do, the plan. 
But as you already know, there's a lot of difference between what we plan and what actually happened. For example, I'm pretty sure nobody expended to forecast that we we're gonna spend $3 trillion on quarter number three, where we are now, or the year 2020. So the, again, the green is the plan. That's what we plan. And we call that the structural. So the structural is what we plan. We, that's the structure of what we plan to do. But then we look, or we experience the actuality of what happened. And for example, let's say, again, I'm just gonna make a graph to illustrate. Uh, let me change this. Let me just make a graph to illustrate this. For example, we can say, this is what actually happened, you know? So as you can see, we are now in quarter number three. So we can say, look, in quarter number one, what actually happened, this is the action. We spend more than what we planned. And then for a little bit on second quarter, we actually spend less than we were hoping because the economy did better, we have more revenue. But then on quarter number three, as you can see, we actually spend it much more and more than what we planned. So then at the end of the year, at the end of the fiscal year, they added the summary of everything. And say, okay, this year, let's say, let me go and look numbers, uh, reality numbers, and let's say, this year we have a 0.3, 3.1 trillion dollar budget deficit. In other words, this year, we spend 3.1 trillion dollars more than what we planned. And then these budget deficits or surpluses is added to the national debt. So the national debt is the accumulation of all the budget deficits since we have been able to keep history. Of course, this year we spend more, so that's money that we, we have to borrow, this year we spend less, and so on. So that's the difference between a national budget and a national debt. The national budget is this fiscal year, what are we doing? Are we spending more than what we're collecting taxes? Or are we spending less than we're collecting taxes? And how, or what is the difference between what we plan and what actually happened? Are you with me? So then the structural is what we plan. The actual is actually what happened. Then we just look at the differences and we see if we spend more than what we plan it or not. Okay. So, I mean, you already know this. You are business as students. For example, what do we call when a government spends more money than they collecting taxes? We say the government is experiencing a, if they spend more than what they collect in taxes. What is it called? That's a deficit. A right? deficit. And what do we call when the government spends more than, I'm sorry, if the government spends less than what they collect in taxes? How would that be called? Think about this. If we spend more, we run a deficit. If we spend more than what we collect. But if we spend less, we experience an equal. A miracle. That's never going to happen. Right? It's supposed to be a surplus, but that's never going to happen. It's a miracle because the government never spends less than what they collect in tax. As a matter of fact, historically, for the last 10 years, the structural budget, remember the structural budget is what we plan. The structural budget is always higher than what they know they were going to collect in taxes. So in other words, we already know how much we expect to collect in taxes and we create a budget that is in excess of that. It's like me saying, I know this month I'm going to uh, only make $3,000, but I'm going to go ahead and spend $1,500. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to put it in my credit card. And the next month I'm going to do the same thing. And the next month I'm going to do the same thing. And because I don't have to pay my debt, I can still do it because all I have to pay is my what? The interest on my debt. You know, think about this. For example, if you're carrying a $10,000 uh, balance on your credit card, how much is the interest on that? It's about $130. So, I mean, you can pay $130 every month and you have $10,000 that you never have to pay. You add another $20,000, another $10,000, now it becomes twenty, dollars and your payment is only $200. So you can still handle it. Another $10,000, now you have $30,000 national debt. I'm sorry, your personal debt. And your payment will only be about two eighty seven. dollars that's the interest. And that's exactly what the government is doing. The government is borrowing money to continue spending and also to pay on the interest on the money they have previously already borrowed. Okay, so we're not using nothing. We are not paying, not even the interest out of our own money. We borrow to pay even that, okay? So let's continue with that so you can understand the dilemma or the problem that we're gonna be facing pretty soon. So, 
the core issue of this chapter is going to try to understand what is the consequences of what we are doing. What is the consequences of a fiscal stimulus? Now think about this. All of us, you know, are okay. What's going to happen with the second stimulus paycheck? I mean, especially you now, because you have already heard that on this new new round of stimulus paychecks, uh, they're also going to give money to college students. You know about this, right? Right, that everybody's going to receive, doesn't really matter your age, you know, it doesn't really matter if you are a dependent, if you are living with your parents, you're still going to get now a check for $1,200, right? So it already passed Congress. The president said that he's okay, you know, signing a second stimulus package. With the Senate have not passed this. They are meeting on June, June frost, which will be what, next Monday? When is June frost? Oh, yeah, next month, I believe, because at this point they're still on Memorial Day break. The Senate is not meeting. So <laughs> we only take one day, they take one week. Okay? And that's what happened when you uh, make the rules and you are the one that determines your salary. It will be like me working for a company, say, I'm going to determine the days I'm going to be working. I'm going to determine my holidays and I'm also going to what, assign my own salary. Wonderful job. Okay? So, <laughs> I mean, that's the reality, government government jobs. Why did that happen? Well, because nobody defends the house. And by mean the house is nobody is responsible for how much money we're spending. So let's go ahead and do it. Yeah, let's do it. 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 Okay. So coming back to my lecture, uh, we're going to try to, okay, all of us are actually now uh, looking at the stimulus uh, uh, check. Is it going to come? Yeah, because everybody likes free things. Even me, I like free things. No. So then as a result of this, then the question is, okay, so everybody's going to be happy because they receive a check now. Our typical family is going to get $6,000. But the question is, what is the cost of this? What is the cost of this? Is there going to be a cost on this? Is that going to affect me? Is it going to affect you? Well, probably it's not going to affect me. I'm too old, I'm gonna die soon. You know, 20 years from now, I'll be an 80 old, 80 year old guy if God give me 20 more years right how much do i have the most you know 30 more years but in your case look at you how many more years you have another 40 50 years easily probably 60 years for some of you so 60 years from now we have to pay this and then the question is how are you going to pay for this well the only way we're going to be able to pay for this is we take a little bit more of your paycheck that's the end of the story so it simply means that taxes eventually are going to go up. We know the solution to the problem. We know the solution to the problem, but nobody in his right mind is going to try to implement it. I mean, how many of you will vote for me and say, hey, I'm an economist, I want to run for office, and you put me in power, you put me there, I promise you the first thing I'm gonna do is raise your taxes so we can pay you know, for the debt. In addition to that, I'm also going to decrease all the benefits and we're going to decrease the social security payments for your grandparents and your parents and also your future, right? So vote for me and we will do that. And you say, Caso is a retarded Mexican, so there's no way I'm gonna vote for him, right? And that's why, you know, we put people in power that we believe they're going to do the things that we want. And what do we want? Things for me. We are selfish individuals. We are one always greater satisfaction, right? So again, we're trying to understand the problem of government inter intervention, okay? So uh, let's continue. So a budget deficit, I already discussed, is the amount by which the government expenditures exceeds taxes in a given time period. And we measure this by fiscal years. So a budget deficit equals to government spending minus tax revenues, which in most cases is greater than zero. Look at this. This is the recent budget deficits. How much money we spend above what we receive in taxes. In 2007, $161 billion. 2009, $1 trillion. By the way, this is the home crisis of 2008 in which we came back and tried to save the auto industry, the banking industry, the airline industry. So under the Obama administration, we give money. Just like now, I don't know, you're too, too young to remember this because for you start 11 years ago, 
Yeah, but the government sent us a stimulus paycheck. And the, the paycheck in, in 2009, I think it was $500. And the government also gave you credit for you to buy a car. The government also give you, send you a check for you to buy an appliance. You know, so you purchase an appliance, a washer or a dryer, the government will give you a tax credit for $500. If you wanted to buy a car, the government will give you a credit for $5,000. And if you want to buy an electric car, the credit was $8,000. So the government was actually giving money to try to stimulate people to buy things. Okay, and as you can see, 1.4, 1.2, 1.3, $1 trillion. Uh, 2013, 680. In 2014, 492, 492 billion dollars. Now, uh, let me let me show you now. Uh, the this is 2014. So now let me go with. Uh, let's see what do we have here. I think this is let's see this is. Uh, Okay. Let me come back. Let me share something for you. Uh, okay. What are you looking in, in your graph there? What do you see in your camera? I see like a Word document with a bunch of links on it. Okay. I say move to something else? No. No? Okay, I'm trying to share this with, okay, let me see if I can reduce this. Uh, stop share. Let me share it again. Okay, and now you see the trend over time, right? Okay, look at this. This is the amount of budget deficits. Like I told you in 2008, we have the Great Recession, the housing crisis, and on the Obama administration, we spent about $1.5 trillion, then about 1.2, about 1.3, then about $1 trillion. Then as you can see, the budget with deficit was about half a trillion dollars, it's still a lot of money, about 500,000, 500 million dollars, 500 million dollars, 400 million dollars, 500 million dollars, 500 million dollars. Look at 2018, uh, about 700 billion dollars. And in last year, right, it was actually one trillion dollars last year. Now, how about now in 2020? Now, let me share this with you. And again, I apologize for this. Uh, where happened? What happened to my Word document? Let me see if I can bring it back. Okay. What are you looking in your screen now? Nothing, right? Okay, so uh, let me share the screen. Let me see, oh, right here. Hold on for a second, I think I got it. Okay, let me go with the projections for next year. This is not the one. Okay, I think I got it right there. So now let me stop sharing this and now let me start again with something else. Okay, I think that at this point, 
I'm showing to you the projection for 2020. See, as you can see on March of this year, the deficit was only $544 billion. Now, by April of this year, the deficit has increased so far to, well, April was $1.4 trillion. And by May, which is not here because it's not actualized, but this curve now is over here about $3.1 trillion. About $3.1 trillion. Look at this. Let me. Okay. And this is the actual government death clock. This is in real time. How is it moving? Like I told you, right before your spring break, the national debt was $21 trillion. Look where we are now. We are now at $25.6 trillion. Remember yesterday in class, we told you that the government collects about three, three and a half trillion dollars in revenue on a fiscal year. We are now in the third quarter. So at the end of the third quarter, the government has collected about $3.2 trillion, right? As you can see, they are a little bit short because the government decided to give a break to the taxpayers, right? To file the taxes until June. So we still short about $250 billion. This is the revenue. We look at the amount of spending this year alone, on this fiscal year. This is how much we have received, 3.2 in revenue and look over here to your left right and it's 6.233 trillion dollars that we have spent on this fiscal year and this is official the official numbers okay so as you can see we have spent almost twice as much as the revenue we have collected so as a result of this that's why our national debt has increased by an additional three trillion dollars okay so we're trying to understand a little bit about the national debt and the budget deficits. So then the deficit for this year, the budget deficit for 2020 is literally a nightmare. And the nightmare is as a result that we're trying to stimulate the economy. Now, according to Keynesian economics, they say, we don't have to worry about a national deficit. We don't have to worry about a national a budget deficit. We don't have to worry about a national debt because the most important thing that we need to do is to stimulate the economy, don't worry about the national debt, okay? So that's where we are, right? And again, we're trying to understand this mentality, if this actually makes any sense, okay? So I come back here. Uh, let me stop sharing this, and let me now shift to my PowerPoint. Desktop, chair. And everything becomes a mess there. So let me close this. Let me close this. Let me stop chair. Hold on for a second, guys. For some reason, my PowerPoint disappeared. Let me close this. Okay. Okay. Chair screen, desktop, chair. Okay, let's see if we can bring it back. Uh, we are now uh, here. Okay. We are back in the PowerPoint slides, okay? So again, this is a history of the budget deficits. So many people believe that a budget deficit is nothing more than a routine byproduct of fiscal policy, which simply means we don't have to worry about it. It's normal. That happens simply because we need to intervene in the economy and the government needs to borrow money. And that's the end of the story. It's not a big deal, okay? So then budget deficit, again, is a routine a routine byproduct of fiscal policy. 
So the goal of macro policy is not to balance the budget, but to move the economy to full employment. I mean, the goal is to move the aggregate demand to the right, right? So again, this is what I just told you. Keynes used to believe that full employment froze, then worry about the deficit. So in other words, at this point, there's nothing we need to worry about it. So when the government collects taxes, the government collects taxes, the government decide how much they're going to spend. But in reality, guys, in reality, they are part of the budget, half of the budget is already automatic spending. In other words, this expenditure has already been approved by Congress and Congress has no choice. So out of every $3.5 trillion they're collecting taxes every year, half of that has already been assigned to payments that the government has already promised to do. And that's what it's called, that's the automatic spending. That discretionary spending is the elements of the budget for which we can decide if we're going to do it or not. Are we going to buy a new airplane? Are we going to create another military base? Are we going to buy another aircraft carrier? Are we going to increase uh, student loan grants? Things like that. Those are the discretionary spending. So again, the automatic spending is those elements of the budget that they are the result of decisions that have already been made in the past. They are uncontrollable. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. Look, let me, let me, let me show you. Well, let, let's continue with this, okay? Automatic or uncontrollable spending account for about 80% of the total budget. Again, I made a mistake. It's not 50, it's 80%. 80% of the federal budget is actually uncontrollable, which simply means there's nothing we can do about it. We cannot touch that. And only 20% of that is actually controllable. So, which simply means the Congress every year, if they want to change the amount of deficit or amount of expenditures, they can only work with 20% of the $3.5 trillion, which is about $600 billion. So that's all the discretion they have, about $600 billion. The other thing is automatic. Right? Again, can the president or Congress repudiate on this? Can the government say, yeah, we, we will simply create new legislation and we are not going to uh, continue paying Social Security? Or are we going to lower the Social Security? And the answer is maybe. Yeah, you can do that. But what's going to happen? What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen if Congress come up with a new legislation and say, we have a national debt that is too high and we're going to reduce Social Security by 15%. What do you think is going to happen in our nation? People Anybody? will not be happy. A lot of people are not going to be happy? And what do you think they're going to do? Riot, protest. I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. They're going to burn the White House. They're going to burn the Congress. Just listen. Just look what happened last night. Look what happened last night. You know, individuals became angry because an innocent man was killed, right? And individuals begin to protest. And it was not only in Minneapolis, it happened in Denver, it happened in Kentucky, it happened in San Francisco, it happened in New York, it happened in Chicago, it happened in Houston, Texas, it happened in Dallas, it happened in San Antonio, all over the nation, there were protests. That's because one man was killed. Believe me, if the government decide to lower the social security, there will be a riot of all men they're going to say, give me my money back. I work all my life and that money is my money and I make my contribution. You give me a promise and you have to give me this money. How do I know there will be riots and they're going to burn the, pres the president house and Congress? Because it has happened in every other nation. In every other nation that have attempted to reduce the benefit that they have already promised to people, there's riot national, at a national level, at a national level. It happened in Argentina. They literally burned you know, some, some of the government houses. It happened in Italy, it happened in Greece, right? And again, this is what happened. So that's the problem with trying to make promises. We make promises that probably we are not going to be able to continue, right? That we're not going to be able to continue. So as a result of this, then we just have to continue you know, giving these people the things that we told them we were going to be giving to them, okay? So, uh, Let's continue. And for some reason, I lost my PowerPoint slide one more time. 
Okay, no, there is. So can the president and Congress, you know, stop making the payments to promises they have made? And the answer is yes, but I don't think it's gonna happen. We can reduce social security benefits. We can just simply say, we are not gonna be able to pay the interest rates on the debt. We can just simply say, forget about the university we're going to be created. Uh, forget about continue paying uh, for unemployment benefits or uh, welfare programs, food stamps, right? Because all these will face political consequences. And what have I told you in the United States? The problem that we have in the United States is that we make decisions not because they make economic sense, but we make decisions because they make political sense. Because they make political sense. And it is sad, it is sad to see, you know, how we make decisions, right? Look, I'm not going to go into politics. I'm not going to go into politics, but I get angry sometimes about what is happening in our nation. A man was killed. People say, we need to bring these people to justice. Bring into the court system. If they are guilty, they'll be found guilty. They are innocent. They'll be innocent, they'll be gone. But we need to bring them into justice because it, it gives us the appearance that what they did was horribly wrong. And people begin to protest, right? And they burn a couple of buildings out of frustrations. And there were just some crazy people out there that they are bad people. There were some people out there that they were just looking for an excuse to rob, to loot. There's no doubt about it. There were some people there that were looting buildings, right? Just simply because they're criminals, right? So our nations begin to separate. People understand what these people are doing and people understand the frustration, but some people do not understand the radical response. So at this point, that's when we need a leadership that say, we're going to find a solution to this. Has anybody read the tweet of the president? He put it today in the official White House? No, this is what he said. All these riots happen in Minneapolis because of a weak mayor. Believe me, that's not gonna happen again. As soon as the looting start, the shooting is going to start now. This is the president of the United States saying I send federal military guys. And if the looting happen, we're gonna shoot them. I mean, what type of president tells, you know, like, hey, did somebody try to break into somebody's building, go ahead and shoot him. So then what is happening is, why, why did he say a statement like that? Why, why will it, I mean, He's my president, but why would my president say something like this, guys? Come on, you're college educated guys. Why would he say something like that? As soon as the looting starts, the shooting will start. To who he's talking to? To his base. You know, his base is a group of individuals that believe that we have to do radical things to change things. Right? You know, how can we make America great? Well, we don't make America great by blaming someone else. We make America great by putting us together to try to find a solution to the problem. And by putting one group against another group, that's not the way we make America great. By the way, America has always been great. And America is great because of us, because of you, because of diversity, because the opinions, because of the values. You know, because we all think different. You know, I mean, if, Melody thinks different than me, that's wonderful. That's what a democracy is. If Cliff does not agree with me, that's perfect. That's how life's supposed to be. We're not supposed to agree, but we're supposed to learn how to work together to try to find a solution. You know, and the solution is not to try to uh, hurt, harm you in, in any way. Okay, so again, this is what's happening in our nation now. We are in turmoil. We're in turmoil because the economy is suffering. And it's suffering not because of bad administration. The economy is not suffering because we don't have the resources. The economy is not suffering because we have made bad choices. The, the economy is not suffering because who, who is in power. The economy is suffering because we have an external shock that came and impacted us that is an uncontrollable. In this case, is this sickness that is taking place. So then the question is, how do we address that? Well, we don't address that by fighting between ourselves. We address that by uniting and say, 
we have to find a solution, right? What do the doctors say? What do the scientists say? And then try to find a way of getting out of this problem, okay? Any questions or any comment? Again, let me come back. So then 80% of the budget is uncontrollable, right? Again, the federal government has already created automatic stabilizers. And automatic stabilizers simply means their expenditures that automatically will kick in if for some reason the economy is moving in the opposite direction. Let me give you an example of an automatic stabilizer. When the economy goes into a recession, unemployment begins to increase. When unemployment begins to increase, automatically those people qualify for unemployment benefits. So by giving them unemployment benefits, then these individuals will be able to continue spending and be able to survive while they find a job. That's automatic stabilizers. People that work all their lives, once they reach retirement age, automatically they qualify right, for social security. Right? Again, examples of automatic stabilizers, unemployment benefits, welfare payments. Right? So again, this is things that we have created in the economy. So then throughout the years, we're going to have cyclical deficits and we're going to have also cyclical surpluses. Now, what is a cyclical deficit? Well, a cyclical deficit simply means that in this cycle, we're spending more than what we're collecting in taxes, right? Either because we want to slow down the economy, right? Or because we have inflation, whatever the case may be, if the government intervenes by spending money, then we, chances are we're going to have a deficit, right? So for example, as the economy slows down, what happened? As the economy slows down, tax revenue declined. Think about the 40 million people that have lost their jobs. Just imagine if these people were just paying $5 in taxes a week. Just $5 in taxes a week, right? That would be five times 40 million. That's $200 million a week. And you already know that these people, they were paying more than $5 a week in taxes. Right? If they were paying 20, how much is 20 times 80 million? $160 million. $160 million in revenue every single week. So now we don't have that revenue. In addition to that, now we all have to got, now we have to give them $600 per week. Somebody has a calculator. How much is $600 times 40 million? Because that's what we're going to do. We're going to give them $600 a week to all 40 million. How much is that? $2.4 trillion. Okay. Listen to this. So not only do we have a reduction in revenue, but now we have $2.3 trillion in benefits that we're going to have to pay. In addition to that, a lot of people now went and apply for uh, food stamps, right? A lot of people went out and apply for uh, paying for your mortgage, mortgage relief, rent relief. You know, so as you can see, then the cyclical deficit that we're experiencing is as a result of the economy going in an opposite direction. On the other hand, if the economy begins to grow, taxes increases, unemployment falls, now transfer payments decreases, Right. So as you can see, then when the economy is going into a time of prosperity, we tend to have surpluses. And when the economy begins to go into a time of recession, we tend to have deficits. Again, the government creates a plan, and we call that this the structural budget. The structural budget. The structural budget is what we plan. With the sad thing is, I already told you that the government in many cases creates what's called a structural deficit. A structural deficit simply means they already know how much they're going to collect and they just simply decide to make a plan in which they're going to spend more than what they collect. So then federal revenue at full employment minus expenditures at full employment under prevailing fiscal policy. So again, the structural deficit is when the government plan to spend more than what 
they know they're going to collect. The structural budget is what we plan. So if we plan to spend more, then we create a structural deficit. If we say, okay, this year we expect to collect three trillion, let's only spend two and a half, then we have created a structural surplus, right? But again, we don't know what's gonna happen until at the end of the year when we compare the structural, what we plan, what, what actually happened, okay? So, we need, to, we need to understand that in some cases, the deficits that we experience is as a result of the cyclical changes in the economy. Like today, this year, the $3.3 trillion budget deficit is as a result of a cyclical change in the economy in which the economy went into a recession because we asked people to stop working, right? So then the question is, who are we supposed to blame for all these deficits historically? Well, the Office of Management, budget and, yeah, it's called the, according to the CBO, what is the CBO, it's called the uh, Congress Budget, uh, I don't remember what the name of the office is. Uh, is the Office of Congress that actually makes the plans, right? They said that in reality, about half of all the deficits that we have experienced have come as a result of a slow recovery. So in other words, we can blame half into the economy did not did as well as we planned it, and the other half, as a result, we just choose to do that, which is discretionary fiscal policy. So if we were to look at the national debt, which is $25 trillion, then we say, okay, about half of that was the result that the economy was doing bad, and the other half was simply because we decided to overspend. Does that make sense? So again, we're trying to understand. So then if we want to correct our problem, we need to focus on changing the structural. The structural deficit was we need to change the way we think. And the way we think is that it's okay to spend a little bit more than what we make every year. You follow me? We need to change the way we think that it's okay to spend more than what we make every single day or every single year. Right? For example, this fiscal stimulus, right, as you can see, is going to increase the structural deficits. If we're giving people money, the question is, from where are we getting this money, right? Now, what we need is fiscal restraint. And what is fiscal restraint? Well, fiscal restraint is when we say, we need to learn how to spend only what we have, only what we make, right? Or let's plan to save a little bit. Let's plan to spend less than what we're going to make, right? That will be a structural surplus. When you plan to spend less than what you know you're going to make. Now, what is the economic effects of all these deficits? What is the economic effects? Okay, I think you already heard this terminology yesterday, crowding out effect. Anybody remember what I told you about crowding out effect? Remember? We discussed that yesterday. I said when the government decide to invest government purchases, the aggregate demand move to the right, right? But the actual impact is not as easy as the mathematical formula that I gave you because we have a crowding out effect, which simply means that investment comes down. Why do investment come down? Why does investment come down when government spends more? Doesn't the interest rate drop making people invest less? I'll, the other way around, sir. When the government spends more, the government is borrowing money. And when the government is borrowing money, that is putting pressure on interest rates to go up. And once interest rates go up, it's more difficult for companies to borrow money. So instead of borrowing money, the company say, let's wait till next year. Probably interest rates are going to be better next year. So the companies postpone investments or postpone expansions, or postpone you know, the, the purchase of a new machinery, or the building of another plant, okay? So that's crowding out. So then the question is, what is the impact in the economy of government deficits? And the number one impact of government deficit is a reduction on private investments, which will mean companies don't expand. And you can see that now. You can see that now. I don't know of any company that is expanding or growing. 
What is the reason? Well, not only because consumers are not buying, but also because there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty of what's going to happen. Okay. So let's continue. So crowding out can occur, especially as the economy goes into full employment, because it just simply means that you know that uh, government is borrowing humongous amount of money. So increase government borrowing to finance a crowding deficit and reduce the availability of funds for private sector spending. Okay. What I just told you that investments decrease simply because there's less money available. So then when the government increase their expenditures, this is going to be offset by reduction in consumption and investment spending. Not only do companies, not only do companies reduce spending, but also consumers reduce spending. Because think about this, if the government is borrowing money, interest rates are going up. And if interest rates are going to go up, up, that's going to affect me too. So I'm not going to be able to move into a new house. Now, let me share this with you, which is kind of interesting. The government is borrowing money like crazy. What is happening to interest rates? Have they gone up or have they gone down? Yeah, interest rates have gone down. You say, Mr. Hasso, then what's going on here? You're contradicting your lecture. You said when the government borrows humongous amount of money, interest rates go up, which is true. But here in the United States, interest rates are actually what? Coming down. As a matter of fact, mortgages, 30 year mortgages, they are at its lowest they have ever been in 30, in 50 years. You can borrow money to buy a brand new house for 30 years for 3.1%. The lowest they have been in 50 years. Why? What is the explanation? Let me give you the explanation. When the government borrows money, the way they borrow money is by selling government bonds. And people invest in government bonds. And that's the way they borrow money. They're selling a lot of government bonds. At this point, this recession that we're experiencing has become a worldwide recession. All the nations of the world are suffering. In all the nations of the world, we have people that have surpluses of funds. They have money. You know, they have wealthy people. And these wealthy people historically have invested in the stock market, right? But all the companies in the world are doing bad. So people have taken away their money from the stock market and they say, we're going to put my money in something that is very safe. I wanna buy gold or I'm just gonna put my money on the safe even if I don't earn any interest rates. That's a safe investment. Or I can buy United States government bonds because they are the safest investments in the world. Because I know that if I lend money to the United States government, the United States government is going to be able to pay me back. It's the strongest economy, the most powerful economy in the world, right? They have a lot of assets. I mean, think about this. If the United States needed money, they can just sell California with all these people to somebody else. They can sell Alaska. I mean, we purchased New Mexico and Texas, you know, and Arizona with all the Mexicans on it. I mean, we can sell all that back to Mexico. We can sell Alaska back to Russia. No, we have a lot of assets. So we are a very wealthy nation. We can sell Hawaii. I mean, who's gonna miss if we sell Hawaii to, I don't know, I don't know who wants to buy Hawaii, but I mean, why not? I mean, we can sell Florida. Some of you will be, yeah, let's sell California. <laughs> you know, so we, you know, so in other words, we have a lot of assets, so as a result of these and foreigners, have been lending the money to us. So then the amount of funds in the United States have not been reduced because the government is borrowing money, but it's not borrowing money from Americans, it's borrowing money from foreigners. So then the amount of money in the United States is still here. There's enough money that if consumers like me and you want to buy a new house or a new car, the money is there. Okay? So then to a certain extent, foreigners have been able to help us continue with this expansion and this borrowing. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, we discussed this. What can the government do if, for example, if the government runs a surplus? What is the potential things they can do? Well, 
we can use that to continue expanding. The government can buy another, you know, military aircraft carrier. We can reduce taxes. We can increase benefits to the people, or we can pay off the debt. And again, this is just theoretically. I mean, because like I said, we have not experienced a surplus since 1981. And the surplus in 1981 was very, very small, okay? So uh, let's talk about the accumulation of the debt. I already told you that the national debt is the accumulation of many years of running budget deficits. I said this morning, the national debt is, how much? Anybody remember? 25. Yeah, $25.6 trillion. Right, so and the way the United States borrows money is by selling treasury bonds. People that want to invest in something that is safe. So then when there is a deficit, the national debt increases. Like for example, this year so far, we have increased the national debt $3 trillion. This second stimulus package that is going to be uh, debated next week. Anybody know how much it is? This package that we're going to dis discuss this coming week is for an additional $3.6 trillion. In other words, we want to put $6.6 .6 trillion of money back in the hands of consumers and companies. So if it passes, then that means that we're going to add an, ad an additional $3 trillion, you know, back to, or to the national debt, okay? Again, in 2011, the national debt was $15 trillion. And in nine years, it has almost doubled. Now we are $25 trillion. Many people say that we don't have to worry about the national debt, but we need to look at the national debt in relation to the gross domestic production. Right. For example, from 1790 to 1917, the amount of national debt was only about 10% or the fashion economy. Today, this morning, right, again, during the World War, II, World War II, it increased 130%. And today, this morning, the national debt is equivalent to 121% uh, of the GDP. In other words, the amount of debt that we have is 21% more than the size of the economy. Because the size of the economy is about $21 trillion, the national debt now is $25 trillion. So we have a ratio, I think I was looking at the numbers right before the class, uh, of about one point, uh, yeah, 121%, 121%, right? Compared to other nations, uh, we are okay, right? But it's still, it just gives you an idea about how big our debt is becoming. See, today is 121. So those, so who do we owe this money? Well, you have to understand that when you buy a bond, you're only lending the money. Eventually, you're gonna get that money back plus interest rates. So then a bond creates a asset of wealth for the bondholder, but it creates a liability for us, the seller of that bond, okay? Who are the people that buy all these bonds? Okay, federal agencies, Right? The Social Security Administration holds about 43% of this bond. So in other words, the national debt that we have, about 43% of the money that we owe is money that we owe to other agencies. Let me see if that make any, this make any sense. Look, let's assume, well, the, the Social Security Administration is an independent agency of the government that collects money from people, right? And then this money is going to be given to people when they become old. Well, throughout the years, the amount of money that we have to pay has been smaller than the amount of money that is coming in. In other words, we have a surplus. So then the Social Security Administration has actually lent the money to the federal government. In other words, they have purchased US government bonds. So then what we have on the Social Security Fund is not actual cash, but it's just a lot of IOUs that the federal government is going to pay me. In other words, a lot of government bonds. Does that make sense? I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. 
So this is something, it might be kind of a dumb question, but I've never really understood it in terms of like, how do so many nations, because aren't basically all nations in debt? Am I wrong? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yes, most nations are in debt. So how how is that? Because I guess like what I'm wondering is how, I don't know if this makes sense, because you're saying like, well, they're in debt because they owe money to bondholders. Mm -hmm. But is the average person also in debt? So how is like everyone just in debt? Like how? No, 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 no. This makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Where's all this money coming from? Yeah. Uh, you're going into a very deep, deep thought about what's going on. But this is what you have to understand. Think about a small nation. Let me use, uh, for example, uh, Nicaragua or Venezuela or Costa Rica you know, or even South Africa. Think about a small nation. These people right there, they are creating wealth between themselves, right? They're creating wealth between themselves. Then those people create a government that's going to try to create the rules of the game. That's the role of the government, create the rules of the game so people will not kill themselves, so people will not take advantage of each other to enforcement, police protection, military protection. Right, so that's what we do with government. We create somebody and also to find solutions to people that they don't have income, you know, to give to people transfer payments. So then these individuals are trying to achieve those goals of giving to people things like that. There's a lot of economic activity on the, on, on the bottom. There's a lot of people buying and selling. Some people are rich, some people are poor, blah, 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 blah. And then the government borrows money to give to those people in this game that they don't have the income. So it's possible that we have much more money in the hands of individuals than is accessible to the government. See, because think about this, the government does not have the power to print money. The government does not just print money. The government gets money by taxing people. So the government gets money from all these people working. The government gets a little bit of money, right? And all these people, they know that they don't want to pay the taxes. So some of these people in many countries, they hide their income. They're incredibly wealthy. Would they put their money in other countries, in offshore accounts? For example, we know a lot of wealthy Argentinians and Paraguayans and Uruguayans, right? That have condominiums worth millions of dollars in Miami. They come, they purchase a, you know, a million dollar condominium, they put the condominium under the name of a cousin they have that live in the United States. So in other words, they're hiding their money, right? And then, you know, those wealthy individuals, they lend the money to another government, they buy bonds from another government. So then the government owes money to a lot of individuals. But the amount of debt that we have by all the governments, is never equal to the amount of income that we're generating worldwide by all the economies. Okay, and, and again, some, some countries have humongous amount of surpluses. Not all have debt, many have debt, not all. But think about for countries like Saudi Arabia, right? They have trillions of dollars. Uh, Norway, Norway, I think, has one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world, about $5 trillion. So the country of Norway has about $5 trillion in surpluses because the oil that they sell. So the country is very rich. Finland, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, you know, all these countries have humongous amount of wealth and these countries are lending the money to other countries. China, up to a couple of years ago, See, because most China, Chinese companies are owned by the government of China. They are not private companies, they're owned by China. So when they go out and sell those little toys that go on the Happy Meals, they're still getting millions and millions and millions of dollars. So in the Chinese government is not giving millions and millions and millions to the people. It's a communist nation. So the Chinese government collects all this revenue from these Chinese companies and they just hold it and they have it. And then they lend it to other nations or they give to other nations. Well, China did never gives. It gives with intentions to buy you, for you to become dependent on them. So then Chinese government buys government bonds, US government bonds. 
So then we, as a nation, have been able to continue borrowing because other people in other nations have been willing to buy government bonds from us. Is that clear? Yeah, no, that was helpful. I guess off of that, though, is there actually enough money in circulation to like actually finance all the debts that like exist in the world? Yes. I don't know if that makes sense. Or yeah. Well, there's enough money out there. There's enough money out there to pay for all this. It's not in circulation because people don't have the money in circulation. But the money in circulation is the money that we use to pay cash. And most of the wealth in the United States is not in the form of cash, but it's in the form of assets that we have, things that we cannot use to pay. Like, for example, I have a, a, a mutual fund that I have invested in a lot of companies. So think about, think about, for example, an average American individual. Think about your parents. Think about your dad. Your dad is probably in their 50s, if I'm not mistaken. How old is your dad? 54? He's 47. Wow, it's a little kid. Uh, Casey, your dad is what? 51. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Late 40s, 50. So even your dad, even your dad, I'm pretty sure they probably have a small retirement fund. They probably don't disclose with that, but they have an IRA or they have a small retirement fund, or probably some of your parents have a big retirement fund. Right? An average working middle class household, they have a retirement fund of about $120,000. So multiply $120,000 by the millions of households. That is money that is there. Is the wealth that they have accumulated, that they have accumulated by working all their lives. We have worked all our lives. And that's the money that we plan to use in the future. So then the question, what am I going to do with this money now that I don't need it? I'm still waiting 10 years from now. So let me invest it in government bonds. So, I mean, that's how how the economy works. So yeah, there's enough money out there. See, because the governments only print enough money to be able to buy everything the country is producing. And for example, the United States, every year we only print 3% more money. We put new money in circulation, 3% more. Of why 3%? Because the economy expands by 3%. So we produce 3% more product, we want 3% more money to be able to buy those products that we have created. Are you following me? So that's what governments do. They print a little bit more money and the, the amount of money they can print is equivalent to the increase in the economy. In some countries, in the past, they have gone wild with this. They have printed money more than what the economy is producing and that's why some countries have created associations in which they take the power to a nation to print money. For example, the European Union. Right, the European Union. Why well, London was never part of the European Union in the monetary system? And the reason was because London was afraid to lose control over monetary policy, printing money, reducing money, because in Europe, monetary policy is being carried by the European Union. And there are other countries that they don't even have their own currency. For example, Bolivia, they begin to print their money, and people say, I don't want that, I want dollars, I want dollars, I want dollars. So the government was printing money, giving to people, paying them with people, and the first thing that people will do will go to the bank and buy dollars. So they got to the point in which they realized that the currency they were printing was worthless because people don't, didn't want it. Now I'm going to go buy dollars. And every time the government print money, they went to the bank to buy dollars, and the sellers of dollars said, well, you have to give me more. They have to give me more because the Bolivian pesos can only be used in Bolivia, but the dollars can be used all over the world. So the government just simply give up and say, okay, I'm not going to print any currency. So we have countries in the world that don't have their own currency. This is what we call the de-lorization of the world, that they're using the dollars as their currency, right? So, another question, so another comment. Okay, so you mentioned how as the economy grows, they typically put out that 3% more money into circulation. So after this, do you think they're gonna try to take money out so that inflation doesn't occur? Um, or just leave it where it's at? They, I don't think they're going to print money, but I don't think they're going to take it out of circulation. If anything, I think they're trying to pump it into circulation. Let me tell you how they pump it. And again, this is, we're going to learn that 
uh, in monetary policy in, in next week. All the banks in the United States, every time they receive a deposit, they have to keep a required reserve. Let's say, for example, you deposit $100, the bank has to keep 10% in reserve. They cannot do nothing with that money. So by lowering the reserve, that means the bank now can lend more money. Instead of lending 90, now they can lend 95 because they only have to give 5%. If they increase the reserve, let's say to 20%, now bank can only lend $80 out of $100. So then by lowering the reserve, we actually increase or decrease the amount of money the banks can lend. So the way we create money in the economy is by lowering the reserve. So we lower the reserve and then banks can lend all the money they receive in, de in deposits in the form of loans. And that's exactly what we're doing now. If anything, the required reserves have decreased and now banks are making more loans, right? Uh, however, not everybody's borrowing money because people are afraid of, am I going to have a job next week? Another question? So why are bonds, like for the U.S. government, why are they viewed as so secure in contrast to other nations if we are? Yeah, because the United States is a very established democracy. And we know that it doesn't really matter what happened. You know, for example, what happened last night, our economy is not going to collapse. The economy is going to continue because we have the infrastructure, we have the highways, we have the bridges, we have the machinery, we have the technology, we have the entrepreneurship, we have the capital. Because we are powerful, powerful, powerful nation. You know, nobody comes close to us. So then if I am a guy from Colombia, I don't know if I want to lend my money to a, my government, Colombian government, buy Colombian bonds, because I don't know if the government will be there next week. Is it going to be a coup? And if there's a coup, those people say, well, we are not going to pay back this money, right? Or is there going to be a civil war? Or is there going to be a recession? So that's why people don't want to invest in those nations. So the choices is you invest in powerful nations, Japan, Germany, you know, UK, Canada, Australia, and the United States. And from all those, then we still know that the United States is what? A safer bet than Canada. It's a safer bet than Australia. It's a safer bet than London. Then, so that's why the United States bonds are more attractive. The United States have the power, have the power to tax people. So if they need money, the government can come and take away your money. The United States government has a very powerful gun that they can put on your head and say, "Give me all your money." If they want to. In addition to that, the government also has reserves. We have gold reserves. We have precious metals reserves, right? We have also, in addition to that, we have a lot of assets. And by asset, we mean, for example, we have humongous amount of oil reserves on the ground that we have not extracted in Alaska, in Texas. You know, we know there's this, the wealth of a nation, but it is cheaper to buy oil from other countries at this point than to extract it. But if we needed to, we can sell our oil to somebody else. We can sell this to British Petroleum and have a British company come and extract our oil from our soil. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, so you talked about how China and Japan and some of those people have bonds, like U.S. bonds. Yes, sir. Do you know if the U.S. has bonds in other countries? Uh, if the United States government, yes, sir, yes, sir. Now I'm trying to think, yes. If you go into the International Monetary Fund and look at the countries, it actually gives you the amount of reserves that we have and it breaks them down into foreign currencies and foreign bonds. For example, we have X millions or billions of dollars in European euros, X billions of dollars in Japanese yens, X billions of dollars in Chinese yuan. You know, so in other words, we have foreign currencies that we keep them as a reserve, just in case, you know, we need to buy with these currencies. So we have billions of dollars of different currencies. We have billions of dollars in gold, silver, precious metals, right? And in many cases, we don't have the actual possession of those goods, but we have the ownership of those goods. 
In other words, we don't have the goal, but for example, we have a payment of a contract that, that Russia say they were going to deliver to us, let's say, half a ton of gold. And we say, I don't need it, keep it there. Well, you have the obligation that when I say, I need you to chip me that half a ton of gold, you will chip it to me. So we have futures. We have futures, we have own futures. We have futures of oil to be delivered to us by Saudi Arabia. We have already purchased from that. I don't know if you heard, for example, President Trump a couple of weeks ago, he said, when the price of oil went down, we have to take advantage of this and we went ahead and purchased a lot of oil to refill our oil reserves. Okay, so we purchased the oil and probably the oil has not been delivered yet, but we own it, it's ours, All right? And if you don't give it to me, you know, I have big guns, I can go get it. So it's your choice. So nobody's going to tell us, oh, I sold you the oil, but I've decided not to give it to you, right? Because we bomb, we bomb your house, period. We have done that many times. Literally, we have done that many times. You know, you make me a promise, you don't keep it, I'll go and bring you back to justice. You know, I'll go and kidnap you. Have we kidnapped presidents from all the nations? Look at, little, look at our history. And you look at me like, what? I mean, have you ever heard of Noriega? Who's Noriega? Do a little Google search, Noriega. Put Panama in Noriega. On your Google search, Panama, Noriega. When you get a hit, let me know. Manuel Noriega, that's his name. The president of Panama, we put him in power, and then he decided not to do what we asked him to do. So then we just find a way of, accuse him of drug trafficking, right? And we win Marines to Panama, we did an invasion, right? And we extract him and he's now in jail in New York, right? We have done that with a lot of other African leaders. I mean, look at Grenada. Do a little search of Grenada. I mean, what's going on in Grenada? I mean, so as you can see, we can invade other countries if they don't, listen to us so they don't do what we think is right or we believe they're doing bad things i mean that's the reality so people respect us and people fear us right you know but the reason why we are so successful is because most people respect us that we're ethical that we're a caring nation we are one of the most ethic well we are the most ethical nation in the world you know, we keep our word when we say we're going to do that, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about politics, but as a whole, American people, you know, they keep the word of all the agreements that we make, right? Any other questions, any other comments? So to who do we owe the money? To who do we owe the money? Why? You know, some of the money that we owe is to other federal agencies, right? Uh, we also owe money to state and local governments. Think about this, for example, the city of Cleveland can actually buy US government bonds, right? And 21% of all the national debt is to private sector individuals like me and you. I would not be surprised if your parents have a, a US bond. Right? People buy the bond, you know, it's 21%. And this is the thing that many people say that we have to be concerned because 33% of all the national debt is money that we owe to foreigners. So how much is 33% of $25 trillion? That'll be 2.5, uh, that'll be 575, about $8 trillion. So about $8 trillion is bonds that we have sold to Chinese or to Chinese governments, the Chinese government, or to Japanese or to Argentinians. 
So why do people like US government debt? Because it's very safe. There's no question that it's going to be repaid. They pay interest rates. You know, they're gonna pay you in dollars. In dollars is the currency that is accepted worldwide. I can go, I can go any place in the world and pay with dollars. I mean, try to do that with Mexican pesos. <laughs> right? They don't even accept pesos in the United States. And that's all what? A neighboring country. Would Mexicans accept dollars? Can I pay you with Canadian dollars here? We don't even accept Canadian dollars. But Canadians accept US dollars. I cannot pay you with euros. But any place in Europe, you can buy euros and you can pay with dollars. Right? Why? Because it's a currency that is very desirable. Again, every time we need to pay our debt, in most cases what we do, we just simply refinance that debt. We just borrow more money to pay the money that we owe, okay? Guys, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's be back at 11.45, okay? Perfect. And we are back, okay. So then the question is, why do people like to invest in government bonds? And the answer is, the reason why people invest in government bonds, US government bonds, is because uh, US government bonds is a very secure investment, right? Uh, and like I said, what the government has done in the past is every time they need to pay the bonds, what they do is just simply refinance the debt, right? And they just simply borrow more money to pay the money that they owe in the past. And that's the way the government has been able to continue with this, uh, I guess, uh, debt, you know, for the last X number of years. Uh, in most cases, all we are doing at this point is just simply paying the, uh, the service of the debt. And by service of the debt simply means all we are doing at this point, we're just simply paying the interest on the debt that we have accumulated. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, at this point, I believe about 11 cents out of every dollar the government spends today is actually just to service the national debt. So it's 11% is the amount of money that we use to pay the, uh, the interest that we owe on the $21 trillion we have accumulated. Now, what is the problem with the national debt? Well, the problem with the national debt is the issue of also the opportunity cost, you know, which simply means that when the government spends the funds that they borrow, those funds are not going to be available by the private sector. And then if you were to choose between investing something by government officials and something invested by the private sectors, we know that the private sector always makes better decisions. And the reason is because the private sector always does a cost-benefit analysis. The government do not, we don't do cost benefit analysis, period. We just do things if we expect is going to allow us to be reelected. So resources consumed by the government cannot be used to produce other goods and services. Okay, and again, this is the opportunity cost. Uh, so then the real burden of the debt is actually the opportunity cost that takes place and the crowding out effect that is take place. Because the cost, that economy is paying is that in many cases, the money is not utilized to the best use. In addition to that, when the government spends money by borrowing, it actually going to create a more crowding out effect. So again, crowding out is simply a reduction in, in private investments. Another problem that we have is that you, future generations, are going to come to the realization that you're gonna to have to pay this somebody eventually gonna to have to pay this, right? So that means that in the future, when the government collects revenue, big portion of that revenue is going to be used just to pay the interest and also portion of the debt that they have, okay? Can the United States pay, pay all of its debt now? And the answer is no, we cannot do that. We don't have enough money, okay? We don't have enough money to pay the national debt because at this point, the national debt is 125, percent or 121 percent of the GDP. The reason we have been able to continue doing it, just like I mentioned before, is because at this point we are borrowing 33 percent of all the money from foreigners. Right? Foreigners is the one that actually lending the money to us. And I think this is the end of the chapter, guys. I don't think uh, 
Many people say what we need to do is put a limit on the depth. Let me tell you, we have done that many, many, many times. We said, we're not going to borrow more than $19 trillion. And then we reached that trillion. Okay, we're going to go ahead and put a national debt of ceiling of $21 trillion. And we're going to 21, now 22, now 23. Not tw so every time we put the maximum, once we hit the maximum, we just go ahead and change the maximum. We put a higher ceiling, a higher ceiling, okay? Again, debt ceilings and explicit legislation that limit outstanding national debt. And we have established this many times. The problem is that once we use, we reach that point, we just expand it, okay? So this is the end of chapter 12. Your exam is going to be on Monday, chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, just like I told you. I am going to open the exam by 10 o'clock in the morning, and like always, I'll give you the two hours, and you'll be able to have the exam. Melody, I did send you an email about your question. Did 8.30 work for you? Okay, I will personally email you the, the text to you at 8.30 in the morning. Melody has to take the exam uh, earlier because she has some, uh, some appointments that she needs to attend, so I work with her. So if that was the case with you, you need something, just let me know, and I'll also work with you. Okay, but I'll email you the, the exam to you. It's not going to be on Moodle because if I put it at 8.30 in the, in the morning, all the other guys are going to go and see it earlier. It's a joke, guys, but it's true. Okay. Have a wonderful weekend, guys. Gita, I hope you have a restful weekend and you are able to rest. Thank you. Lara, I didn't even know you were here in class. I'm here. Yeah, okay. We know that we, you always find excuses. <laughs> why, why you're not here so i didn't even know you were in class i'm here <laughs> yeah, glad to know that you are here okay. yeah <laughs> with you ashley we cannot see your face or hear your voice oh i know i just didn't want to use my camera this morning because i was eating breakfast and stuff oh, okay well we're glad that you are here mm -hmm. cliff today you are not you yourself you were not smiling like always you know <laughs> you're grumpy cliff today you are grumpy today okay Okay, guys, have a wonderful day. I love you. See you Tuesday, Monday's exam, so I don't see you, but I'll see you Tuesday. Bye-bye.